Hi everyone. Um, okay, so it's Sunday evening, it's six o'clock and um, we finally get to give you um, a bit of a project that Barnaby, uh, a bit of information about a project that Barnaby Festival has commissioned this year, um, Our Future is Ancient. Um, and in a moment I'll introduce Simon Buckley, who's uh, the artist responsible for the project. Um, uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to give a little bit of background um, in terms of Barnaby Festival, because there may be people who have tuned in who um, don't know very much about the festival and um, don't, and it's kind of good to have a little bit of context first before we start. So Barnaby Festival is a biennial festival. Um, it's started, it's actually, it would have been, it is its 10th year today, it's its 10th birthday today. Um, um, and uh, um, originally um, we'd planned to have for 2020 Vision um, a 10 day festival program. Uh, the first weekend of that was going to be called First Light and that would have been this weekend and the second weekend would have been called Second Sight. Um, and as we all know, COVID happened and so we have had to completely revise our plans. Um, and so we have this festival weekend um, which this is the last event of, uh, which is um, about seeing Barnaby differently and doing things digitally so that we can keep our communities safe. And um, Barnaby Festival is very much rooted in the town of Macclesfield. It's uh, run, produced um, and celebrates its arts, um, it celebrates its artistic and creative communities. It uh, kind of draws on the heritage of the town. It is the heritage of the town in that it's a uh, eight nine hundred year old festival or festival space um, and we're very grateful that this year we've got Arts Council England funding funding from Cheshire East and from Mac Town Council, Macclesfield Town Council and also from the Granada Foundation as well as a number of um, sponsors and individual donors um, that ha has meant that we've been able to do something differently this year and this weekend. So I'm really pleased that we were able in the first place to commission Simon um, uh, to do some work with us, um, not least because it seemed very appropriate for some of the themes of the festival um, and some of the kind of practices and processes. And this weekend we hope to um, kind of show you some of that work in progress. And, and so uh, for various reasons, which you'll hear quite a lot about, um, we will. Uh, we won't. We weren't able to do that. But things didn't go to plan, but we are still able to share with you the work that Simon's undertaking and to have a kind of sneak peek. Um, uh, and then we can uh, pick up some questions from anyone who's tuning in and offering questions via our social media channels um, at the end of our discussion. So, um, so this is a little prompt for you if you want to send a question to Simon um, about the work or about his uh, kind of attitudes to uh, his creative life, um, then use the hashtag see Barnaby differently on Twitter or on Facebook. And um, you should be able to um, kind of log your thoughts or your questions there, and then I'll pick them up at the end of our discussion. Um, so, I'd like to introduce Simon. In fact, I'm just going to get you to introduce yourself, really, Simon, um, and to ask you the first question, which is um, to tell us a bit of, to give us a bit of background, really, and to tell us a bit about the kind of art you make. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, Simon, the main project I have been doing for the past five years or so has been called Not Quite Light, and it, it, it started off as, um, as, as a very personal project and has emerged in effect to become what I do. So in terms of the art I make, um, it's based primarily around film and photography, um, but I now use sound and audio and have started to write as well. Um, not quite light started off in 2015 or late 2014. And um, it was in response to a sort of very dramatic change in my life circumstances, a long-term marriage had broken up. And I was living in the center of the Northern Quarter with a friend and we'd walk around Angel Meadow uh, together at night he'd be walking his dog like Bill Sykes and um, we talked about old Manchester we obviously knew the city very well having lived here for most of our lives and talking about his changes and I just got a sense in Angel Meadow where 40,000 people are buried and it's where Marx and Engels did their research because the conditions were so bad 
um, that I remember looking down at some gravestones and there was a bit of reflected light from the new CIS building opposite. And I just had the simple thought of if this light brought these souls back to life, you know, what would they think of the city that, we, that they created? We created, you know, would they be amazed or would they be disappointed, you know, asking with all the resources, is this the best you could come up with? So I then began to look at themes of regeneration and heritage and use the dawn into um, day as, as a metaphor for from new into old and very much about transition. I was going through my own personal transition. So the work uh, started from that. And it, as I say, that's what I now do. And um, it's it's starting to each year change. Uh, I've even now started to do a festival uh, once a year, which obviously had to uh, stop because of the, the COVID situation that was cancelled in March. But it, each year there seems to be something new that becomes suggested. So every year is a kind of new element of a personal journey um, as I kind of keep going on to tiptoe and tripping myself up and challenging myself to do something new. Okay um, and what's the kind of what are the practices what you know what, what are you producing for your work what's what, what do we get to see? Well a lot of these days is digital files these days you know with the advent of websites and social media it's very ethereal it's ephemeral sorry it kind of you know, exists and yet it doesn't exist in a way. And I also quite like that with the um, the elements of transition, you know, does a digital file ever really exist, you know, except in our minds. Um, I sell prints, of course, um, but I don't really seek to exhibit so much anymore. I find um, going into art galleries sometimes a little difficult. Uh, and I think going forward, if I'm going to show the work, I'd like to do it as books and magazines to distribute, but really to go into places like pubs and local social clubs and project it like an old uh, slideshow, you know, when people used to show mm -hmm. the holiday slides and things, to actually take the work quite deeply into communities. I think, um, I, I obviously understand the value of art galleries as places for gathering and to, and to um, share art within cities and towns. But with what I do, I'd quite like to project it onto walls and uh, go into people's homes and go into, pe into pubs, as I say, and kind of have people interact differently with the work other than just simply put a print on the wall and a frame with a caption underneath it. Mm -hmm. I quite like dialogue, you know, I quite like interaction with people because people have got stories to share. And I think I see my work as a catalyst, you know, I think to be so ego driven that your work as the finished project kind of dampens down its potential um, for stimulating debate. And so I like the idea of being a catalyst as much as anything else. And then sort of stepping back once I've set ideas in motion and other people begin to take it and their talents become and feed on it and they take it in their direction as well. That's what the festival really does, I suppose. And 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 likewise for Barnaby, very much the spirit of Barnaby in that it is a you know collaborative, collective exercise that requires participation. So I mean that brings me on to uh, my next question was really about your relationship with Macclesfield, and uh, if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to 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 work here and 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 kind of how you feel about the place. I mean, I've spent life being fascinated by the collisions of coincidence that we encounter each day. And um, for me, like a lot of people that lived in the Northwest all their lives, Macclesfield was a station that you passed through on the way to somewhere else. You know, I, I had, my father grew up in Stoke and my grandparents were there. So I spent a lot of time going through Macclesfield station um, as, a, as a young boy visiting my grandparents and, and my father. And then last year, I can't remember exactly how, but somehow a conversation must have happened somewhere, with Manchester Maxwell, where a project emerged for a, a festival called Mac Lit, which was last autumn, I think, wasn't it? October, mm -hmm. autumn. And I said, I'd like to um, play with this idea of passing through Macclesfield Station. And it's, you know, the, you know, the kind of the relationship I'd had with it as a boy, uh, going to discover the life of my father in effect, you know, because he, he did separately from where I was living. And, um, I, I didn't really know the town at all, apart from Arigi Bianchi, which everybody does, and occasionally driving over the Cat and Fiddle um, and other bits through, obviously, Joy Division and John Mayle and people like that. But really, it was a, just a small town that I happened to pass through. And then because of the festival, I was caused to spend a lot of time there photographing at dawn and um, producing work for my own performance and another event that was there. And I have to say, I kind of fell in love with it a little bit. I grew up in Bolton, just north of Manchester. And so I suppose there was a familiarity about it, a town that was industrial, um, 
but also surrounded by hills, which Bolton is, you know, so I think I was used to the idea of the landscape um, rearing up from the backs of houses and mills and things. That was something very familiar to me. But also I, I found its architecture fascinating. I found the eclectic nature of its architecture, uh, its Georgian and Victorian architecture. And streets didn't seem to make sense to me when I was walking around them. They seemed to be too long for where they were. And I got the feeling as if the, the town was moving and um, and shape-shifting as I, I, as I went around it. So it felt like a place of magic and uh, the ginnels and alleyways that existed there. There always seemed to be something new to discover. And I like that in towns and cities. There, there seemed to be sort of depths to it, historic depths. And I began to really sense its ancient um, quality. Uh, and then I started to uh, go into the forest a little bit more just because I was curious. And so um, I think probably then we started to talk, didn't we? I can't remember. Uh, quite at what stage and I, I said I'd like to do more to explore the forest and, and the, and the um, relationship between the town uh, or an urban place and and the place of nature. Yeah which um, obviously was exciting to me because um, a bit of an obsessive at the moment particularly around uh, thinking about the relationship between um, common land uh, and uh, kind of and the town and its heritage and uh, Macclesfield Forest um, kind of way that it has a very strong relationship um, because of all the resources it had for the way that the town has developed. So we should move on to talking about the commission and talking about our future is ancient. Um, tell us about the inspiration for that and tell us about what you know you're hoping the project can achieve. Well, I think when I started off, which was um, winter solstice, December last year, I considered myself quite rightly to be a complete idiot really when it came to my knowledge of nature like a lot of people I had been out walked camped and understood it to a degree but really my knowledge was very poor and very low so I approached it from a position of ignorance and I sort of wanted to be uh, imbued with the the magic of the forest and I kept thinking about um it, you know, it's an it's a ancient hunting forest, isn't it? You know, so, uh, you know, and there, are, there are burial mounds up there and there's all kinds, again, these ancient ley lines and the stones that people can't quite uh, work out. So all of the time there is mystery there and there is um, human beings trying to work out what's going on in their world. And that's gone through each century. So each century you look back into the forest, there have been human beings and, you, can, you know, there's war that's come from there with the bowmen and the archers from uh, mm -hmm. Macclesfield. Mm -hmm. There's been the Black Prince. So you've got the plague as well. I mean, all of the things, you know, that kind of parallel our century. We've still got wars. We've got a pandemic. So all the time when I looked at the way in which uh, the forest had evolved and um, its, its current status, it just felt as if we kept repeating these cycles. And so actually, you know, what we, we do is we look back into our past to understand our present and then our future. So, of course... Uh, it just made sense. It just fell out of my mouth that actually our future is ancient because all the time we are, you know, it's a very obvious thing to say in a way, but we cannot disconnect from this very basic human uh, primal self and the way in which we relate to uh, what's out there in, in nature and the forest itself. You know, trees with their, uh, ain't, you know, they, their longevity and they're, they're way different to obviously human time frames in terms of life and the way in which they interact with the earth beneath them, the mulch and the, the hyphae and all of the way in which fungus reacts and communicates with other trees, etc. I also saw it as a place where um, there was uh, science still to be discovered, you know, and the things that we really just don't know about, which are monumental and profound. And uh, we as humans, I think, take for granted so easily. We're very arrogant about our status as being the cleverest species without ever looking at the way in which other species have their worldview. And, um, and so, again, the title addressed the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot to explore and there's a lot of humility that needs to be brought into our um, consideration of how we interact with the, the natural world around us. And are we, I think we must have been talking before the end of last year um, and you started the project when uh, you started the project in December 2019. Yeah. So tell us a bit about the process of what you were doing um, and then also, you know, what's happened since March you know, and, and how um, as, as we, lockdown has come in and, and yeah. how that, that's affected. I mean, do you want to play uh, some slides, uh, some pictures, Matt, while I'm, um, I don't know, we've got so we can play. Um, so I, I think when I got out of the car on, it was December the 21st, I think it was the solstice. And uh, my head was full of fairy tales like Hansel and Gretel. You know, we are 
as children told stories of really quite terrifying <laughs> bleakness, aren't we, about forests. There are, they are places of monsters and uh, dark secrets and people that enter them quite often meet terrible ends, you know, or something so magical happens to them that they change, they become from one creature to another creature. So as a, so we are kind of imbued with this. And I was conscious of the fact that, although I, I live in Salford, um, I felt more safe walking around the precincts and the streets of Salford than I do uh, I did going into a forest, which actually was incredibly safe. You know, it just had strange noises, but the darkness, you know, there's something kind of quite primal reacted within me. So the first couple of visits, I had to really talk myself into walking into the darkness. Um, and I say there was ignorance. So I was responding to what was just visually interesting as opposed to really understanding what I was doing. I, I do think that when you start up, um, a project, you do have to, in a way, allow for that organic growth. I think if you go in with a fixed idea of what you get, you, you, you shut down opportunity. So I don't mind the fact that I didn't know what I was doing in a way. I, I sort mm -hmm. of embraced that. I think that's the place to start from. You have a rough idea and then the thing begins to emerge before you and you find your path and, um, you know, all those metaphors come into play. And I think um, by about February time, it was beginning to make sense to me that um, I, the fear of being in the forest had, had gone. Um, I was actually really looking forward to going. I was actually slightly resentful of daylight arriving. Um, you know, the shriek of barn owls and the corvids. I was beginning to recognize the order in which birds woke up and things like this. So I began to be aware of if I was um, you know, from before the internet age or whatever, actually it was observation that helped me form conclusions. There may be wrong conclusions, but they were my conclusions. So, you know, I also noticed that the full moon seemed to bring in clouds, you know, so if it'd been really good weather for the few days beforehand, my conclusion would have been based on my experience that the full moon brought bad weather. So all, all the way through, I was kind of just working this uh, process of, of, of exploration and uh, to try and diffuse my ignorance really. Uh, and by the time we got to the lockdown in March, there was a, a new relevance emerged from that. You know, it suddenly was from being, I mean, I've spent most of the lockdown in Ancoats with my partner and, you know, I can see the city skyline and um, I was aware of the fact that people were shut in and uh, you could see people in all the apartments around about no longer going to work, et cetera. And I felt quite claustrophobic, quite hemmed in. Mm -hmm. And um, so to see this, to know the forest was there in the distance, it began a craving within me because it suddenly felt to me like a place of sanctuary, a place to escape to, a place of wilderness away from uh, this, especially sort of knowing that perhaps the pan pandemics that are going to emerge are based on our attack of, of um, our natural spaces. So um, as, the, as, the, as the lockdown continued, my relationship to the project suddenly, I felt, took on a, a more profound um, way of, of seeing it. And an idea began to merge in my head about, um, I learned that trees communicate underground using uh, fungus and stuff. And um, it occurred to me that perhaps, you know, with the power of the subconscious, if there was some device whereby I was part laid down with these roots and somehow this communication melded with my mind, that actually I could actually start to bring the urban place to trees to get them to understand what was happening in our world. If it could communicate, if a tree could communicate with me and the tree could communicate back, it could help me find cures and paths and, um, and the sanctuary that I was craving. So I began to sort of see this kind of, it was a fantastical thing. It was a magical thing, like a fairy tale, but that's now how the project has, 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 uh, has ended up being. It's being this kind of pursuit of my relationship with the forest on a very kind of within the mind place really, rather than just being a physical me with a camera and a tripod and some pretty trees at first light. Um, it's been, and I think I wouldn't have got to that without the lockdown. I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously the lockdown has affected everyone, but it's interesting uh, and, and in many different ways, but it's interesting how it's also affected the creative process. And obviously for some people, it's had to put the creative process on hold because they can't reach their studios or they can't access the right equipment or uh, or their employment is coming to an end. Um, but um, but yeah, like you say, I think as soon as lockdown came, we all had that recognition that the actually the countryside was coming into the, the town, especially here yeah. in Macclesfield. I can actually, I can see the forest just about from my uh, bedroom window and I can see the sunrise over it and so uh, I thought a lot about the work I knew you were doing because uh, the moon rises over the forest for me as well 
um, but also when the we were able to start to hear owls and and and, and other new noises in the town in the middle of the night in under clear skies, um, it has been a kind of incredible time in some ways. So you've been going to the forest uh, monthly and uh, full moon, yeah, full moon, taking photographs, kind of reflecting on things, having experiences. Um, what were the plans for Barnaby Festival for this weekend um, in terms of showing some of that work and tell us about what happened in terms of <laughs> why we're having a Q&A this evening yeah. uh, and not able to release a kind of full um, uh, way of viewing uh, the performance that you were going to plan. So. Sure. I'll just chat about that and I think then there's going to be a short clip of work that we put together that's an example of kind of what we were aiming to achieve. So mm -hmm. yeah, the, the plan was to, um, uh, I wrote some text, I've spent the past few weeks writing some text and um, I'd been making film as well as taking photographs while I was out in the forest. And so the plan was to perform basically, there's a, a, a particular location in the forest which I consider to be the kind of emotional heart of the place. You know, there's a, a, a strange hut and a, a very old sycamore with this huge long bough that stretches up towards the stars. Um, and I found it one night, uh, one one time, and um, in that dawn, there was the most strange noises that came through the forest of geese and heron uh, disturbed, and there was rutting stags and there was barking. It was the most kind of primordial um, uh, mix of noises. And also there was this, strange um moment as i was listening to this where there was this like a whirring coming down the hill as if there was a freewheeling cyclist and then this powerful um wind i suppose a zephyr kind of swept over my uh, shoulder and i looked around i couldn't see anything that had caused it you know but in um uh, maybe it was a police drone i don't know what it was you know but there was some kind of very strange thing that happened and i couldn't really a place what it was and it caused me to turn around and I heard this trickling stream and it drew me and in the dark you obviously can't make sense of where paths and things are the place feels different size a different scale and everything and and so I walked in and found this hill and went straight up this hill and found this space and it just felt as if I'd been directed there by this pattern of energy and these very strange noises and because normally when I've been there the night has been quiet there's been no real sound the odd shriek of owls or the odd hoot but um this was really unusual you know this seemed to be a proper a proper disturbance happening and um when the daylight came um suddenly there was like a really easy path out and it like nothing you know it didn't have the drama within the dark you know um but I, I've, I've sort of cited the uh the, the project there and um i was going to perform you know basically i was going to work in this hut and then move and i was going to basically perform the text and we were going to film it uh film the performance and then um put that uh, film together um for uh, solstice official last night which was at uh, i think at 22 43 so we we're going to go on live with that however <laughs> um because of lockdown i presume actually the forest has started to be uh, a playground for people hasn't it trying to escape um a huge outpouring of energy and um so there's been raves and parties and i think one of them had nearly caused a really quite serious fire there so the police um quite clearly wanted to clamp down on that and Somehow, I don't know how, but um, our project got mixed up with the idea that we were a rave. And um, so we suddenly became the enemies and um, it became quite clear on, I think, was it 30 Friday? So just before we were due to do this, that we weren't going to be able to go into that um, space and do it. And then, you know, we kind of pivot. You try and find solutions, don't you? It's around remote beat. And then um, we found another space. Uh, one of your colleagues, I think, found a really it's on private land who allowed us on. So we went down there, found there was no network. So suddenly the live streaming was out. And then um, while we were waiting for the film crew, um, a, a policeman intervened and escorted the film crew out of Cheshire, which I felt was quite medieval, really. You know, it's the kind of thing that happens in a baronial mm -hmm. way where um, um, people are escorted from the uh, from the from the manor, etc. So um, we walked up a path at one o'clock in the morning, uh, away from the woods, to meet the film crew. Found a message, came into Signal, found a message saying <laughs> we're basically been escorted out of Cheshire and you're on your own. So we had about an hour to make up a film, and I had a new GoPro which I used and. Uh, just ran around um, making footage with torches and things like that. So it was very uh, DIY, quite exhilarating, but um, there's hardly any, any nighttime, obviously, on the, on the shortest day. Only had about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I think I slept for about, I, I was awake for I think 26 or 27 hours through the Friday, Saturday. So, um, but the, so we came away and, um, and then obviously because of that, it became quite clear that um, we weren't gonna be able to stitch together a film in time for the evening. So that hasn't happened in, in the way that we intended. But, you know, these things always have uh, unexpected consequences, which uh, tend to be quite positive. I think I've learned a lot from what I can now do with this in terms of how I put the, the, the footage and the content together. And just on a very kind of personal level, watching the sunrise from the tops above uh, Wilberclough and then out into the Cat and Fiddle was, was really sublime. It was a really beautiful moment. And I will, for many reasons, always remember this night in my life, you know. Um, but I, I don't, you know, it's been stressful for everybody. It's been very difficult and tiring. But um, as I say, ultimately out of it, well, I think well, something, something will advance for me on this. I think I've seen, a new, I think I have seen a path in a way kind of being thrown away from the forest as sort of, as I suppose, as is in the way of pollen, you know, I was blown somewhere else and uh, I've, I've come down to a new location and actually that's caused something else to emerge. So in a way I've sort of reflected the natural growth and spread of the forest through this, you know, I've been taken away by an unexpected gust of wind and out of this something is going to emerge. And I, I, I you know, I feel kind of very privileged that that's happened. You know, it's uh, quite an emotional thing to, to absorb. Uh, yeah, and I say, I mean, interesting, you've taken an environmental way of thinking about it there. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, we referred to forest law earlier, in some ways being expelled from the forest because you wanted to plunder its resources of, you know, clean air and, and, and somewhere to party, except that's not what was intended. That's mm. what other people have been doing. Um, uh, and, the, you know, it's the police who, that we've spoken to um, since have said it, they, they sympathize with people who have wanted to go and do that you know, there's nowhere else there's no nighttime economy what else do you do so yeah. I think the parallels with um, medieval times and forest law and and now with the pandemic are kind of really strange and, and yeah because I, I ended up the um, up on the top road where there's a plague stone I think it was well, they don't really know what it is but they guessed it's a plague stone didn't it whereby uh, they sent it must have been sort of the end of where one area was infected and the other wasn't and they left food there and things mm -hmm. so again it felt a sort of fairly apt way to conclude uh, the halfway point of the project actually was to kind of go to this place as the sun rose and watching the the, the mist drift across the tops next to this um, plague stone it, it sort of felt very profound uh, to be there quite spiritual so are we going to run some an extract of, of yeah i'll just explain a little bit about what what the extract is i suppose and then it will make sense so this is a um, um a short snip from uh, what is basically it was a four scene uh, performance and this is from scene three so the idea is i've left the city uh and gone into the forest and um this is my uh, moment of discovery that um, if uh, I, I'd, I'd heard that trees um, emit sound in the key of A, so I played with that idea. So this is the moment when I lie down and uh, hum in the key of A and somehow manage to trigger uh, a process of absorption whereby I meld with the roots and the sap and the, uh, the communicating qualities of the tree. So it's about two minutes long and um, there's some audio, audio and music and sound that I've, I've written and put with it as well as some visuals that we've mixed up um, today. Um, and this will be sort of a, it's kind of a, 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 a draft in a way, because I think, you know, the film going forward is going to learn from this, but um, it'll give you some idea of, um, of what's going to happen. So, um, and, and we yeah. should say before you run it, we should say a massive thanks to Matt Jones, who is, is the person that got escorted out of the county and that has been, uh, working gone. nonstop for 24 yeah. hours as well. So I think, um, you know, he's done a great job with the edit and I'm really uh, proud of what he's, what he's achieved and, uh, so there's probably rough bits to it, et cetera, but I'm, I'm, I think it was great and I think he's done a good job. And uh, as I say, it's been a real uh, signal pointer to how this thing can now uh, progress, I think, going forward. So, and this is it. So this is a snip from, I think, scene three of Our Future is Ancient. My body falls across outstretched roots, and the crown of my skull, a fontanelle, rubs up against the main trunk of the oldest sycamore 
which the giant bow belongs to. Feeling safe under this shelter, I recall reading somewhere that trees emit sound in the key of A and I try to listen with my ear close to the wood and I also hum my own tune. Simple notes repeated over and over as if trying to get a baby to sleep. My lids fall shut and in the near darkness the world takes on a different larger dimension beyond my shuttered sockets. After maybe seconds or minutes or hours I I can't tell. I sense a pulse. It's faint and irregular, but like the rhythm of a swollen river has coherence and then something extraordinary is happening. I become like a dandelion seed caught on a summer zephyr, transformed into a drifting spirit, no longer anchored within a corporal form. I burrow deeper within my mind's blackness and see, really see, the inside of my own living subconscious. <laughs> it's a, a, a paralyzing jumble of thoughts and emotions presented as colors, patterns and images. It's a, oh, uh, a, a busy high street at Christmas. It's the, it's the massed choreographed ribbon dance of a thousand workers. It's a factory assembling spacecraft sections. It's uh, the collision of two oceans. It's a lonely summer meadow under a deep blue sky. It's the autumn leaf fall of a million trees. It's a murmuration at dusk. It's a sparrow hawk making its crepuscular kill. <sighs> it's an unknowable galaxy contained within a mortal skull that will one day join the rotting detritus beneath me. It's a universe occupying a temporary home. Yeah, so that's the yeah. first airing okay. of the footage. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks again to Matt for um, for putting that together so so quickly and so so well. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so I. Um, I can see that we've got some questions on social media um, so um, and there's actually a few that are kind of asking about your work. I'm going to try and group some of them but I'm also going to make sure that we try to cover as many as possible if that's okay. Um, so uh, first of all we've got um, a couple of questions from uh, Sheila New Mills, um, which is about what do you think the most important thing for you personally has been doing the project? Um, you know, for example, do you think it's helped you connect more with nature? Um, and also, um, have you considered running workshops on building a connection with nature? Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question that from Sheila, because as I said, when I started off, um, you know, my levels of ignorance were quite shameful, I think, really, you know, when I, you know, I've done O-level biology or whatever it was and hadn't been great at that. And I, um, I was really aware of my ignorance within the forest, you know, I, you know, I don't recognize particular bird song and, you know, the trees I had a rough idea, but not really. And it's, it's um, caused me to do a lot more research. I uh, have a pile of books by my bed now from people all through from Robert McFarlane and uh, Richard Maybe and there's all, all kinds of uh, books I've got there now. It's going to take me best part of six months to read, I think, you know, a, a real library of stuff. And hopefully I'll begin to recognize what's going on. I mean, learning that thing about trees communicating with each other, it takes you into an entirely different understanding of what happens when you walk across. You know, I was one of the things I was aware of is if they have warning signs and if I'm walking across twigs and crackling or whatever, you know, when I touch the bark, does a tree go, what's happening? You know, I mean, what, you know, I don't know actually know what nature's response is to my presence there. You know, the arrogance of humans is to go, it doesn't care, but who knows? You know, maybe there's all kinds of things happening there. So um, it's caused me to really attack my ignorance, I think, you know, and I know my city really well. I know my red brick and I know my streets and I know how, how cities work, etc. But I'm now going to try and apply, hopefully, that same kind of level of experience to. So, in terms of workshops, I think I'm probably too ignorant yet, um, Sheila, to uh, do <laughs> workshops. But um, who knows? I think in terms of perhaps um, going with groups and and, and exploring 
places and actually seeing what we all find and, and seeing what questions would emerge from that. That might well be a, an interesting thing to do, you know, to take a group of similarly ignorant city folk into the city um, and see what questions emerge. You know, what is it that we, we are unsure of there? Because that's where curiosity emerges and that's where great answers and solutions come from, I suppose. You know, it's about igniting curiosity. Again, being a catalyst, I suppose. And I suppose, I mean, yeah, we have examples like forest schools and uh, team building exercises. Um, and I think we're going to find out many more examples of ways that we might um, work with our natural world um, through this pandemic and after it, um, which uh, you know, will show about its benefits. Another question from another Simon. Um, in fact, uh, I know this Simon, Simon Woolham from Macclesfield. And uh, at my festival. Yeah, one of the things, quick side, Barnaby Festival has been full of Simons. You are one of many, Simon Buckley, uh, and you too, Simon Bloom. Um, so Simon's question, um, he says, really interesting and profound title. Um, could you say a bit more about the, the title in reference to um, our relationship between the, or, or the relationship between the, the past and the present and the future? Well, I think, um, you know, sometimes it can sound like a bit a bit stoner or a bit six form, you know, when you consider the idea of ghosts and spirit and things. But actually, there is so much that we don't know scientifically, it feels to me, um, that actually our connection with slipping into parallel worlds and portals and what we've seen. I mean, that those little moments, like when I said, you know, there was that strange energy that passed over my shoulder on that morning in the forest. There may be a very what people would call a rational uh, explanation for it. Um, but we never quite know, do we? And I think um, I like to try and remain open minded. So our sense of um, the way in which the earth contains and, and, and emits en energies, I feel a lot of my work in life has been governed by instinct. You know, why is it I've walked down that particular street as opposed to that one? Again, going back to that idea of the collisions of coincidence that keep my work as a photographer in particular going, you know, the relationships, you know, and marriages and things all, all down to little moments of coincidence. So I kind of think, um, you know, and I, I often have been, um, I don't know what you use the word psychic, but I'm often quite good at sensing something that's going to happen and come along, etc. I have, I don't, you know, and I kind of think there's energies at work that we just simply don't understand as yet. Uh, and also our dreamlike place, you know, and um, when you read about um, tribes in, in the Amazon or other indigenous populations, you know, they take this stuff for granted. They just assume that their relationship with nature is connected by these energies because that's how they've survived for thousands of years. And actually, they may be the more uh, intelligent, intuitive uh, versions of human beings. And we've arrived at in our city life who kind of keep boxing ourselves into these very kind of capitalist based uh, ways of thinking. So in terms of what's ancient, I think it's kind of going back to, you know, what is it as humans that we have as our most basic, in, you know, if we were kind of in effect naked, I suppose, you know, both intellectually and emotionally, uh, as well as physically, you know, where would we be at, you know, and um, because actually that's still that force within us. And there seems to be an awful lot of denial around that. So in terms of thinking about that future is ancient, actually, I think perhaps our future is, if we don't reconnect properly with that and begin to value ourselves as part of the animal world and part of the natural world, we will stop, we will cease to exist, I think, you know, so I think a lot of the title is about, we need to acknowledge this, actually, for me. Okay, well, I'm going to be putting it in the risk assessment for next time that you may or may not be naked, so. Um... I may not. <laughs> So there's um, another question that's kind of connected uh, around uh, the idea of ancient, but also about story making. And it's from uh, Claire Robinson. And she asks, have you read any of Alan Garner's work, which connects to the ancient law around um, Macclesfield and, and the forest and the places that you've been visiting recently? I haven't as yet. And it keeps popping up. I, I tried to buy a couple of his books and they said they were out of print or unavailable. And I just kind of then forgot to try and uh, hunt copies down. But obviously, I think it's going to be important for me to read these books. Um, you know, you've mentioned them, um, your colleague David does not mention them and uh, Claire. So I think there's obviously a lot for me to learn from these books. Um, so, yeah, if I can find copies, I will read them. You know, I've read um, Seabolt, you know, his um, Rings of Saturn um, in terms of how he walks through the Norfolk countryside uh, and he mixed fantasy with fact. Um, and I think I found that quite inspirational. I read um, uh, Robert McFarlane quite a lot. I quite like his approach to nature. Um, so yeah, I think um, 
I can't, honestly, I've gone, I've gone, I've got Rackham's book downstairs, looking at the way in which you can identify elements of the English um, countryside. You know, what do the various bits of topography mm. and clues? You know, it's all about clues, isn't it? I suppose, and and what they can mean. Um, so I think, you know, my I, I hope to, if anybody's got recommendations for books, just keep them coming because at the moment I'm buying them like I'm a bit possessed, really, because I think I'm going to really focus on this project for the next six months. And I don't think it can really uh, evolve properly unless I inform myself better. Really. So a gift set of Alan Garner. One, um, uh, on expenses um, but also I mean I should note uh, people in Macclesfield have a very, obviously a very strong affection because his work steeped in the countryside that surrounds us and and also we were very much hoping to be able to have um, Liz Garner in conversation for the festival um, uh, on actually would have been I think this weekend um, but of course we haven't been able to do that so we'll we'll try to revisit that and she's currently looking at story making um, kind of honouring her father but not doing the same thing and going back and looking at, uh, um, uh, at kind of fairy tales and, and, and how they how they play into modern life. Um, uh, so I think she she has a, a book around that coming out soon. There was another question again from Simon Willem, which was about Robert McFarlane's uh, recent book, Underland, which yeah, I think read, yeah. you have read. So I, I think we've, we've answered that. So there's a, um, a question here about the soundtrack actually, um, which uh, talking about trees in the key of A. Um, this is from Michael Walsh, and uh, he says he's impressed by the soundtrack, which is great, um, uh, because that's quite high praise for Michael. Um, and he says, has this stretched, or how has this project stretched you musically? Or has it, yeah. Uh, I think it's probably just at the beginning of what it ought to do for me. You know, I, I studied music at school and then just became very lazy with it, really. You know, so I, I used to spend a lot of my teenage years playing Irish music in pubs and things, and then just life took me away from doing that and so uh, again I think the past five years since my new life began as I call it since uh, my, my marriage ended and I've gone on to a new life it's been about discovery I feel more like a teenager than I've ever done I think and so musically it's something that's really important to me to reconnect with I bought myself some keyboards and uh, a couple more desk amp recorders and I've got a clarinet which I've no idea how to play but um, it's going to become increasingly important to me that um, I create music for this um, that in effect I see the project not as a photography project or a film project or whatever that it becomes kind of all elements can be bound within it so it may well end up being a series of short films in which there is uh, written text uh, which I read and this music and the sounds that I'm gathering together in the forest you know so all the time I think I mean, Bowie famously said something along the lines, isn't he? You need to go into the water and it's only when you're on the tips of your toes and the water's around your chin that the interesting stuff starts to happen and I think there's a kind of compulsive form of madness within creation because you put yourself under unnecessary stress to a degree, you know, but I keep on tripping myself up. I keep pushing myself into that water, doing things that I have no idea how to do on the basis that eventually I will know how to do them. And therefore my life is more enriched and I can in effect tell my story, but it's about learning vocabulary. It's like learning a language, isn't it? If you can, if you've got more vocabulary and you understand the grammar, you can actually explain your story better as opposed to just grunting and nodding your head and waving your hands about. So I sort of see the process as about that, you know, kind of enriching my own um, knowledge so that I can tell the stories better and engage with people better. And, you know, cause it's an interchange of ideas, I suppose, isn't it? It's been interesting during lockdown to see quite you know obviously there's been some um the, the essential work has been done obviously by people in hospitals and delivery drivers and all of those incredibly essential key workers is not an understatement but it's also been interesting to watch that people's immediate turn has been to cultural life you know the what's got people through emotionally uh through has been kind of unexpectedly challenging in a way i think um, is relation to books music film arts culture etc so you realize that as an artist, what you are is a filter. You know, you kind of like you're like a woodland creature going sniffing the air and trying to make sense of what's going on. And because you kind of put yourself through that process of filtration and understanding, then you can pass these ideas on to other people. And that's how they then get distributed. Again, looking at the way in which a tree works, you know, you suck it all up, you process it, and then you put it back out and it goes back out into the network and the system. And then other people can can benefit from that possibly, you know. And I don't mean that in an arrogant or I know better than everybody else. And it's just that this is my compulsion. This is what I was born with. And I go and do it. And um, it either works for people or it doesn't. Um, 
but I'm, I'm knackered and now this is it <laughs> you know I kind of <laughs> stop doing it you know every time I think why have I got why have I said but it's, it is it's a compulsion but ultimately you know if I can um you know be that catalyst for people then I feel as if my work as an artist is 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 right you know and that's my role that I have here you know I think well, it's interesting. Uh, Lynn Froggart, who um, she's a social psychologist based up in, well, she used to be based up in, in in Lancaster, and she talks about participatory arts and participation in arts is the place that um, is the aesthetic third. It's like a third space, and it's a place where, when you're taking part in it, you can take more risks. Um, and that's what, in some ways, the artist does. Is it? It's it, it, or, or artworks are able, collective artworks are able to scaffold risk and and and, and allow people to to kind of explore different types of emotions. Sometimes they're not great emotions either. It's not always that culture and arts mm. make you happy. They might make you reflective or sad. Um, so, and that brings me on to the last couple of questions, um, which I'll kind of take, well, a comment and a question which I'll take together. Um, Lisa Gledhill um, says that she once did a guided midnight walk with Macclesfield Forest Rangers, and she'd love to do a midnight photography walk with you in the forest. So I think, you know, we've got some ideas there. Um, well, I think I can and see that happening, you know. I mean, I think it is an extraordinary time to be out there, you know, especially just before, you know, midnight's one thing, but going out just before... Uh, dawn when the, the birds are beginning to wake up you know you hear some extraordinary things and your senses are so alive aren't they when you're in the dark and you know you're taken away from that you know continuum hum of, of traffic you know your your everything is alive within you it's a very mm -hmm. extraordinary time so yeah it may well be that perhaps as the project goes on that we will you know that's that's one of the things that may happen perhaps well yeah. Sa sally uh, in manchester also suggests a similar thing um uh she says would you be interested in involving young people in the project and introducing them to nature through the work instead of partying in the forest perhaps which... <laughs> uh, yeah again i think so you know i think about my own kids you know and they're you know they haven't been out into uh the natural world as much as like you know they're very much city-based salford-based etc you know so they're growing up there so I, I think about them and when they go there they're generally amazed i think about you know when children when you that magic of do fairies exist well let's pretend they do and let's go into a forest and let's not let's not tramp all over magic you know i think the other thing is that cities can sometimes uh, dampen down our sense of magic and Again, one of the things I've loved about doing during the lockdown is walking the streets of Manchester and Salford uh, six to ten miles at a time away from the city centre, which I'm, I'm kind of fairly indifferent to these days. Um, and looking at the edgelands and the wastelands and the kind of the wild eccentricity of a city like this place, um, you know, and it rebuilds magic. And I think, you know, it, that would be too easily lost in our daily lives. Uh, you know it's become a bit of a cliche to say these things but it's it's true and uh so i think going into the forest you can kind of begin to see those parallels and in recognizing those parallels that's when i think you can begin to see that existing primal animal self and how we therefore connect to the wider world and not just simply to getting up going to work making money for somebody else and coming home you know so um yeah and i think you know after this weekend as well you know, I can really see how this project is now going to continue for the next six months, you know, that we're, how we might, how I might begin to progress it and, and what it might look like at the end. And I was going to say, what can we expect? Um, but maybe we'll just have to wait and see. It's been really exciting to get a glimpse of what the work is going to end up being like um, through it's the extract. Slides, Matt, you, as we wrap up, do you want to put those last few slides on that? Yeah. Um, and, you know, so that gives us a taste of what, what, what might be to come but we've also managed to crowdsource some other ideas too which might get incorporated um your point about uh kind of the magic of the forest and 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 young people and kind of children and keeping it alive i think we are really lucky here in macclesfield because we have such easy access to it and uh my daughter my youngest daughter ava um who is 14 today she's a barnaby baby she, I used to t make make her, force her to go or lead her into the forest um, when going for walks um, by taking up chocolates and leaving them at the fairy castle, which is not that far from, I think, where you've done some photography, Simon, um, in Toot, Hook, Toot Hill. And that was a kind of way of, of trying to, um, through the medium of chocolate, introduce a bit more magic into her life. Um, so um, I think that we will wrap up uh very shortly because um i think it's the almost well it's not even almost the end of the longest day actually we've still got um 
a few more daylight hours, quite a few. Four, five, um, but, but I think um, I think that the Barnaby team and uh, Matt, especially and Simon, uh, we're all you know we have had um, an experience this weekend, um, uh, an experience that we won't forget. And um, I'm excited that we'll be able to do some some more work together um, and kind of not distantly and not digitally in the future yeah so if if people want to get in touch with simon and ask him more questions uh via social media then you can find him as not quite light um on uh, twitter and instagram um and you've also got your own kind of website and yeah and just not quite light dot com yeah yeah so uh feel free to kind of ask away and and get in touch um and uh we hope to see everyone um, for the next stage of the project, um, uh, um, maybe at the milk winter solstice for some public performance. And yeah, cause we're gonna, I'm going to carry it through to the, I mean, this is one of the things that's happened because of the lockdown is that it should have ended this weekend, shouldn't it, in theory. We're going to exhibit it and perform it. So actually, yeah. it's as a cause of that, I've decided to carry it all the way on to the full arc of the 12 months through to the winter yeah. solstice in December. Yeah. Uh, and then it might end up as a, as a book or something at the end of that, you know. But yeah, it's kind of got a, an extra life because of this i suppose um, okay so yeah we'll be we'll perhaps think of something to do won't we <laughs> we will always think of something to do so thanks very much for your time thanks for everyone who's tuned in uh sent questions um and listened uh to what we've had to say and what we've had to discuss um and hope to see you next barnaby if not before um time for a glass of wine i think <laughs> all right thanks very much bye thanks,